What's up with all those Fault in Our Stars ripoffs? Straight up. I feel like after the Fault in Our Stars came out, there's this weird thing where suddenly... I'm willing to sacrifice everything. Everything, everything. Five feet apart, are you in? I'm not giving up, no, I'm and Earl and the Dying Girl. Have fun watching this incredible movie. We're not the couple who doesn't try. Midnight Sun, rated PG-13. All of these teenagers are not only sick, but they are also sexy. Before we get into all of these cheap knockoffs, I think we should start where it all began and re-watch The Fault in Our Stars. <laughs> Does The Fault in Our Stars hold up? No, it freaking doesn't. I was absolutely shocked about how awful this movie was. I remember being 13 and seeing people online criticize this movie and criticize the acting and the writing and just everything about it. And at the time I was like, oh, it's because they don't like teenager movies because young adult culture loves to like play the victim where it's like everybody hates us because we're a teen movie no everybody hates you because the movie freaking sucked it opens up with this voiceover where hazel grace is just lamenting about how like first of all she's sad but second of all her love story isn't like other love stories because she's sick i like that version as much as the next girl does believe me it's just not the truth which is really funny because i have like five or six ripoff movies that have the same plot. Something I forgot about this movie is just all the stupid freaking moments in it. Oh my God. At the beginning when Hazel goes to support group, there's this character who's like one of the people who leads the support group or whatever. There's an entire montage where Hazel Grace like mocks how he had like ball cancer and there's no punchline, just the fact that like, it was his balls. Basically, they found it in his nuts. She's literally talking about how sad she is about her cancer and how that's affected her. But then like two minutes later, she proceeds to mock somebody else's cancer. You wanna know what I really forgot about this movie? The fact that Ansel Elgort is freaking scary, y'all. I'm saying the way that he delivers his dialogue is scary. When he first meets Hazel in support group, I remember it being like fun and flirty and they're like staring at each other. And in that scene, they play like this lighthearted fun music. But... <laughs> It goes on for so long and it's scary. And it's especially scary because he's an alleged rapist. In some scenes, he's like the sarcastic, but also like carefree guy. And then in other scenes, he's like lamenting about oblivion and how that's inevitable. What does that even mean, first of all? Like, I understand that like oblivion is inevitable, but also that makes no freaking sense at all. Oblivion is nothing and it will happen because we will die. But like, if you say it like that, it's not deep at all. When you die, you're dead. <laughs> they did Divergent together and then they did this movie together and everybody loved to harp on the fact that they went from brothers to lovers. <laughs> so I just remember thinking that they had a lot of chemistry, but honestly, they just don't. The iconic okay scene where they're like, okay, okay, for like a painful amount of time. It's honestly unsettling. I should probably go to sleep. <sighs> okay. 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 Perhaps okay will be our always the way that they delivered the dialogue where it doesn't feel cute at all. It's scary. I would say the biggest issue with this movie and honestly all of John Green's work is the fact that all of the characters talk exactly the same. All of the characters are just an equal level of deep and funny and they don't bounce off of each other at all. They just are like, we will be dead and we will be sexy while we do it. There are scenes where Hazel will like use a big word and then as a person watching the movie, you're like, oh, nice, big word, I wonder what that means. 
There's always a Hamarsha, isn't there? And then instead of just picking up on context clues, they'll just freaking say the definition of the word in the next sentence. Hamarsha. A fatal flaw. Because clearly, everybody who watches young adult movies are stupid. The parents are the best thing about this movie, straight up, and I totally forgot about that. Laura Dern showed up on set and she brought it, y'all. She showed up and she got it done. Laura Dern does such a good job in this movie that all of the other people that are supposed to carry this movie look like freaking clowns. Hazel will be in her room and she'll like make a sound or like call for her mom or something. And every single time the mom like books it up the stairs because she thinks that there's like a medical emergency or something. And there's actually a pretty cool callback to that later on in the movie where she does have a medical emergency. And then there's like flashbacks to when Hazel had first been diagnosed and was sort of in the thick of it and the mom is crying about how she's not gonna be a mom anymore. Like, it freaking gets me. I'm not gonna be a mom anymore. <laughs> And then in the next scene, they'd cut to Ansel and Shailene, and you become more aware of how they're not that good at acting. Not Disney. Did this movie get no flack for the fact that they literally make out in Anne Frank's literal house? You know Anne Frank, the kid who was murdered through the Holocaust? in a mass genocide against the Jewish population. Yeah, well, <laughs> they made out in her actual house. It's uncomfortable because they're in this house and we see scenes of Hazel like climbing up the stairs and having a hard time because she has cancer. And then they cut to like audio of like Anne Frank's diary reading and how she's like young and like dying. God wishes to see people happy. And they try to like mirror that to having cancer. And I feel like it's just a little bit different. It's kind of uncomfortable to watch a scene where you see the main characters watching Holocaust footage and hearing the voice of a dead Holocaust victim. And then 30 seconds later, they're making out. And then of course there's the scene where Augustus is telling Hazel while they're in Amsterdam that he's gonna die and that basically for like this whole time he's had like several like cancers. And then Hazel Grace just proceeds to make out with him and then the scene is over. Honey, my chest, my liver, just everywhere. For years, I've heard people complain about the romanticization of cancer, and honestly, I kind of feel it. There's the whole like, write a eulogy and perform it for me, baby, and we'll do a funeral and you say it to me while I'm here, which is just uncomfortable, honestly. And then there's the whole like, make a wish sex vacation, which feels uncomfortable. You may be wondering, are you mad? And honestly, I am mad. Why is it that every single book that I ever liked in the year 2013 turned out to be shit in the end? I would say the biggest issue with this movie is just the fact that it takes itself way too seriously. And with all that being said, <laughs> it's still the best one on the list. Eight out of 10, pretty good. Mean or on the Dying Girl is so upsetting to me, not because the character is dying, of course, but because um, I've never been so angry. Essentially, this movie follows two white teenagers. One is named Greg, he's our main character, and then we have a second character called Rachel, and she has been diagnosed with leukemia. They were like kind of mutual friends back in the day, maybe, and they go to the same high school, so they are acquainted with each other. And when Rachel is diagnosed with leukemia, Greg's mom says to him, like, go over and make her feel not so sad that she is basically going to die pretty soon. But in this process of him going over to her house and cheering them up, they start to become friends. Greg and his friend Earl, they make movies together. And so what they decide to do is they decide that they're gonna make Rachel a movie before she dies. At the beginning of this movie, I was actually really excited because this film was showing some artistic qualities, which I was shocked about. There is some claymation thrown in there. Cause it's acid that these crocodiles are just pissed. The film begins with a bland voiceover from our main character, Greg, and as soon as this boy opened his mouth, I knew, boy did I know that this movie was gonna cause me trouble. I guess I could use one of those classic story beginning sentences. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. 
But what would that even mean? Right away, you notice the fact that Greg is an idiot with no redeemable qualities at all. He's like this nerdy guy who doesn't have any friends. He like tries to stay away from the cliques in high school and he's like just trying to survive high school and not make anybody mad or whatever the frick, but he failed because he made me mad. He's one of those characters who like just says random things and then people are like, haha, that's so random. And it's just annoying. How was your summer? Summer? What does that word even mean? Like more sum? <laughs> There's a scene at the beginning of the movie where Greg's mom says to him that Rachel has been diagnosed with leukemia and that he's gonna go over to her house and like comfort her and be her friend and make her feel better, I guess. And then Greg proceeds to be the freaking worst, of course. Dagan, my friend, you are going to pick up that phone. You are going to call Rachel again. You are going to. You are going to. There's this entire scene where he goes on this long, long monologue about how like Rachel's pillow is sexy and how like maybe he wants to have sex with it. This is a nice pillow. This pillow is a dude obviously, but it reminds me of this pillow we used to have named Francesca. They have a similar coloring. Anyway, Francesca we had to eventually give away because in the end that whole situation was just a real problem. It was a mess. It's one thing to like make a joke where he's like, haha, but they never do that. And then as an audience member, you're like, wait, did he actually think that that pillow was sexy? Does he have sex with pillows? It's like a Shane Dawson video. Please say psych, please say psych. And then he never freaking did. So he for sure had sex with that pillow. I feel like everybody on the internet always makes fun of the I'm not like other girls trope, but nobody ever talks about the I'm not like other boys trope, which is even worse to be honest. Greg isn't like the other boys because instead of like having a normal conversation, he likes to make weird noises. <laughs> He's just so awkward and so different than the other boys. He's not good at sports. He's not sociable. He just likes to like scream and that's funny. What is that noise? I mentioned earlier that The Vault in Our Stars was pretentious with its characters and with its writing, but I would say the biggest issue I had with this movie is the fact that it's pretentious, not necessarily in its writing, but it's pretentious in like the tone. I do wanna talk about the character of Earl and just how messy he is, oh my God. Earl has the privilege of being the only black character in the film, and what the writers of this movie decided to do with this character is just make him like a stereotype, honestly. I'm obviously not black, so I can't like say that this is inherently bad, but I'm just gonna put it out into the universe and see how we feel about it. Greg and Earl, they live in the same neighborhood, but for whatever reason, Earl lives on the bad side. His house is a short walk from mine, but in a much tougher neighborhood. And then at first I was like, maybe they're making a commentary about how stupid that is but then they don't even mention it. It's just so confusing. His whole family sits outside on the porch with like their dog barking at everyone. There's like chain link fences. Earl likes to fight. Come on, this bitch. Come on and keep hey, walking. You want my right number or something? Again, man. It just feels uncomfortable and uh, it's shitty. The whole theme of like Greg having no friends and just trying to survive high school without making anybody mad. And then at the end, after his friend is close to dead, he starts to make all these friends and like the popular girl wants to take him to prom. It literally feels like an incel fantasy. Once the prom is over, Greg goes to see Rachel in the hospital and to show her the movie that they finally finished. And so I thought that they were maybe gonna do a thing where Greg like wasn't showing his emotions and then while Rachel is like on her freaking deathbed, you see what she means to him. But then the movie he shows her that they were supposedly working for months on is like black and white images of random side characters smiling at the camera. There's like deafeningly loud music and then like a stop motion, whatever the frick. Like that was the climax of the movie and then it's over. I give this movie a two out of 10 because no jokes were funny and I'm pissed for no reason.
everything, everything made everything, everything in my life worse. This movie is so ridiculous to me because it does freaking nothing. If I were to try to describe the way that this movie makes me feel, it's clown. Basically, this movie follows a chick and her name is Maddie and her whole deal is that she can't leave her house or she will die. Of course, the movie opens up with her pretentious dialogue through voice or... I don't leave my house. I haven't left my house in 17 years. You might be wondering, like Caleb, how do you know what type of medical issue this chick has? I have severe combined immunodeficiency. Here's a drawing to explain. Oh, thank God. And also, like, what would happen if she did go outside? If I went outside, I'd die. Our plot kicks off when a sexy white man moves in next door. Basically, he's Love Simon, except he has long hair and he looks like he smells for some reason. There's this nurse that lives in the house with Maddie to like make sure that she doesn't die or whatever the frick. And the nurse is like, hey girl, I know that you're desperate to get banged by this white boy. So what I'm gonna do is, is despite the fact that you will probably die, I'm gonna invite this boy into the house. And I was expecting this scene to be like somewhat triumphant because they spent like 30 minutes like texting and flirting and whatever but then when they're in person with each other it's like so insanely awkward and uncomfortable They have no chemistry whatsoever, and it's like honestly so upsetting to watch. The whole beginning of this movie was stupid, and I was like assuming that it would get not so stupid as the movie continued, um, but then the abuse started to happen. No! This girl who will die decides, you know what, I will just run out and then like ask him if he's okay. Maddie? Maddie, what are you, are you doing? Okay? And then it's played off as like not freaking stupid. Just when I thought this movie couldn't get any more clownish, my rainbow shoes showed up from Amazon Prime. She decides, you know what? I'm so desperate to get banged by this boy that I'm going to sneak out of the house and I'm just gonna tell Ollie that I'm not sick anymore and that I took like a freaking like day quill and now my life-threatening illness is gone. The movie plays it off as like this triumphant thing about how like I haven't lived for 17 years and I'm finally gonna live. I'm not choosing death. It's that if I don't go, I won't really know what it's like to be alive. But like, no you're not, you're gonna freaking die. I feel like if I was a clown though, I would be one of those clowns that wears like the stilts and I'd be like a tall clown. Honk honk. And so Maddie tells Ollie, she's like, yo, guess what boy? I basically found out that I'm fine um, and that don't ask about it, but I'm fine. And he just goes along with it and then they proceed to like fly to Hawaii to have a sex vacation. It's weird though, because this entire section of the movie where they're outside together, it's played off as like this montage and we don't even see them like really talk to each other or get to know each other anymore. Don't die. I'll try not to. This movie is so boring. I was to the point where I was like, I can't wait for it to be the third act when she starts to die. Daddy, are you okay? Oh dang. <laughs> There's a scene where she's like in heaven. <laughs> and so this is the part of the movie where things got weird. Maddie gets a call from the doctors and they're like, hey girl, basically the thing is, we were doing tests on you when you were dying the other day. And turns out the only reason you got sick was because apparently we noticed your immune system is like so weak for whatever reason. And then the girl's like, but I have this thing where if I go outside, I'll die. And then the doctor's like, no. And so Maddie goes to confront the mom and turns out this snake ass bitch made up this friggin' disease for whatever friggin' reason. Have I ever been sick? 
No, it does say that like the reason the mom did this was because like as mentioned at the beginning of the movie, the brother of the main character and the father, they died in some freak accident. And so the mom went all psycho. My eyes were so glazed over at this point where I was like, I'm freaking excited for this. I was thinking the mom was gonna like chase her with a knife or something. Literally, it just ends with like, Maddie flying to see the white boy who is like in New York City or something and then they like run towards the camera with the pop song in the background and then the movie's over. I wanted to see some throat slit. I give this movie a 3 out of 10. It could have been cool but it was basic and it made me feel like a clown so honk honk to that. Our main character's name is uh, did I write it down? <laughs> I really didn't, did I? This movie follows Bella Thorne and she is allergic to the sun. I have a rare genetic condition called seroderma pigmentosum or XP, which basically means a severe sensitivity to sunlight. I really want you to hear this. She can't go out in the sun. Can't go out in the sun. So she can't ever go in the sun. She can't go in the sun at all. If she goes out in the sun, she will die. And so at the beginning of the film, she like takes her guitar and like goes out and plays by like the friggin' train station or whatever the frick. She starts singing in her auto-tuned voice. I'll be up all night playing through this twilight dream. And so this is when we're introduced to our sexy white love interest. I don't know his name, but he is white. Hey. Uh. This white man, every day she watched him walk home from school. She never talked to him. She never said anything to him. She doesn't know him at all, but she knows that he's sexy and that is enough for her. And so she's like talking to him. And this is the point where the writing and the acting is just so upsetting. Um, I, I have to get home to my cat. Your cat? Yeah, it died. So you're not in a rush then, right? No, no, I am. I, I have to plan the funeral for my um, dead cat that died. Bella Thorne isn't a singer, but they make her a singer for this movie. And you can tell that it's like completely inauthentic and that the vocals are freaking botched. I slip my shoes on, take a spin or two. Tell me, how does this look to you? But like, whenever she sings one of the songs she wrote, I feel secondhand embarrassment. I feel secondhand embarrassment for this character, but also for the people who wrote this fake song for this movie thinking it was kind of good. I probably wrote a better song when I was a child. When I was a kid, I made a song called Make It Right. Um, I don't know why this is stuck with me, but the lyrics were make it right in your heart, do it right, make it right. Make it right in your heart. And I would sing it. I first of all love the fact that her voice sounds like god awful, but on top of that, she's not playing that guitar at all. Everybody that's around like gathers and starts to like, like it's like a summer camp. I used to work at a summer camp and whenever there'd be music playing, the kids would like Da 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 Make it right <laughs> in your heart Did I rhyme right with right? Make it right, do it right? I did. The most upsetting thing about this movie is probably the fact that when the white boy takes off his pants, his underwear goes down past his knees. And then... The sun starts to come up. <laughs> What? Oh my god. Katie, wait. Oh my god. Oh, shit. Katie, what are you I doing? I need to go. Katie, wait, wait, I... Katie. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why I laughed when she started to die. What's going on? Katie, you have to go as fast as you okay, can. Okay, okay, I'm going, I'm going. Katie, what? Please, just go, Charlie. You're scaring me. You're you scaring have me. to speak okay, fast. Okay, okay. And so after this, she like runs in her house and she's fine. The movie literally says, it's like, girl, you're fine. Don't worry, you'll be okay. But maybe, just maybe, later on, you will die. 
just letting you know that. And then you're like, okay, when the third act hits, then there's this brilliant scene where the white boy Googles <laughs> what her illness is. And then there's like, a montage of her saying that she can't go out with him in the daytime. And then from this point on, it's just a love story again. And like her like life-threatening illness was just a side quest. For the rest of the movie, they do Bella Thorne's makeup in like this way where they give her like these drastic bags and like white face. She looked like she was on meth for the last half of the movie, which I did appreciate. Basically, it's time for me to die. She says, I'm feeling pretty sick, guys. Basically, the plan is my white boy will take me on his boat in the sun. I want to go with him on the boat now. Honey, it'd be better if you just stay Please, here. Dad. Basically, this movie's like, she's kind of sick, so she's just gonna die now. <laughs> and so, the movie ends and she goes out on the boat with the white boy. She chose death so quickly for a man she met like days ago. And I feel it, girl. I was expecting the movie maybe to have a reveal where like it turns out that she wasn't allergic to the sun at all because I was fresh off of everything, everything at this point. But no, they dump her literal ashes into the river and then the movie ends. Out of all of the movies I watched for this video, this is the freaking worst one. There was zero sophistication in this movie at all and it was clearly made for like a quick buck. In my notes I wrote one out of 10. It was cheap, did nothing, and used a real life illness to make a sexy plot twist resulting in a suicide. I was jealous when she died. <laughs> Okay, y'all, here we freaking go. A movie that I actually freaking liked. Basically, this movie follows Maisie Williams in an ugly wig. Her whole deal is the fact that she has cancer and she is gonna die, obviously. But our other main character, his name is Calvin, and he's a hypochondriac, and he's convinced that he has cancer. So at the beginning of the movie, he goes to a cancer support group. I don't know, they say that he's there to like, see what it's like to have cancer. So he'll see that he doesn't have cancer. I don't know the psychology behind that, but that's what the movie said to me, so that's what I'm gonna go with. They meet in support group, um, <laughs> which sounds familiar. Support group. Support group. Support group. When I found out that the plot was our characters trying to accomplish a die list, I was feeling not so great about that. But then as the movie continued, I realized how fun that was. I thought the things on the list were gonna be like stupid pretentious things, but instead they were just like so funny. <laughs> One of the things on her list was literally like show up to a party in costumes, even though it's not a costume party. Look alive! Sky, you said people were getting dressed up. Which I guess in theory maybe sounds stupid, but when you watch it, you can't help but laugh at it. All of the things on her list are so fun to watch. And even though they do show it in a montage, it's still funny to see what they are and just to see them acting these things out. They even mentioned The Fault in Our Stars directly. And at first I was like, you're ripping off a movie and then you're gonna make fun of that movie in the process. But honestly, this movie is so different tonally than The Fault in Our Stars where yeah, the fault on our start is freaking stupid. My to die list. It's like a bucket list, but not as lame. Don't worry, I'm not gonna drag you to Amsterdam. I would say the weirdest aspect about this movie is just the romance, which isn't between Sky and Calvin at all. It's between Calvin and Nina Dobriv. They work at the airport together, and I was under the impression that the character of Calvin was like 16 or 17, and that the character of Nina Dobriv was like 
25 or 26, but they play off this romance as if it's completely normal, where I wouldn't be surprised if Asa Butterfield and Nina Dobov were similar in age, but they look so different in age. But luckily the romance doesn't have that much screen time, but I was still upset that we wasted so much time on it. I would say one of the best aspects of this film is certainly the tone and how upbeat and fun it is. It doesn't take itself seriously at all, which at this point in watching all these movies was so refreshing to me. I really enjoyed seeing Calvin and Skye's relationship. They bounced off of each other really well because Skye is so outgoing and outspoken and Calvin is more shy and sort of inward. Get arrested with Calvin. You just added that in. My list, my rules, look him up. One of my favorite recurring bits are the cop characters which like, hold on, like I know that's a little bit controversial, but the shtick is that the police officers keep letting them off the hook because they have cancer and they feel bad. Come on, you should have said something. All right, get up, boy. You're okay. <laughs> All right, not your fault. Not your fault. Um, fuck cancer. Whoa. I'll walk this off, you kids have a good night. It gets to the point where the police officers feel so bad for Skye that they like arrest a guy that she has a crush on so that they can get his phone number and give it to her. And I know you're probably thinking like, yikes to that, right? But like, it's funny, right? It's fine, it's not a big deal. Seriously, I will have you and your whole family arrested. All right. You absolutely suck. Thank you very much. Anyways, now that we're in the third act of the movie, it's time for Sky's health to deteriorate suddenly for no reason. It does become like painfully formulaic at this point because you realize that it's the same setup for all of the movies. The formula is so basic and annoying that like I low key want to die. Oh shoot, was that insensitive? I'm sorry, girl. <laughs> I would definitely say the best aspect about this movie is the tone for sure. It doesn't treat itself super seriously. It's really laid back and fun, which is honestly the way I live my freaking life. The big issue with all the other movies is that they treat themselves like so seriously, yet have like zero things to say at all. And it's fun to watch a movie, not try to say anything, just try to make you laugh and have a good time. I give this movie an eight out of 10. Maybe dying isn't hot, but it sure is fun. <sighs> Jesus Christ, here we go. This movie features two, um, let me check my notes here. Oh yeah, white teenagers. The girl's name is Stella and the boy's name I promise it's not a bit. I really don't know any characters' names ever. But he's Zack from Zack and Cody. Oh wait, or is he Cody? All you need to know is it's Zack and Cody. This movie opens up really originally with a voiceover. Human touch. Our first form of communication. The whole setup is the fact that Stella and Zack Cody have cystic fibrosis. They're doing an extended drug trial in a hospital, and so they're living in the hospital for a couple of months. If the patients get closer than five feet apart, they could theoretically exchange this bacteria, and that's bad for whatever reason. Even though in a lot of sections of this movie, they don't stand five feet apart at all, but whatever. She is actually a fellow YouTuber and she makes videos about cystic fibrosis and what it's like to have cystic fibrosis. You can tell the people who wrote this movie don't know how YouTube works because all of the characters call her videos her movies. How do you know that? I've seen all your movies. And on top of that, whenever she's filming a video, the viewfinder is flipped the wrong way. The character of Zach or Cody is weird because they try to make him like a bad boy, but he is severely miscast as a freaking bad boy. Everything about him is sexy. The slight nasal in his voice during his line delivery is so upsetting. I love you. Stella finds out that he hasn't been doing his daily treatments or taking his medicine. And so the compromise is she will help him do it so he doesn't die. And in exchange, he gets to draw her. And when I found out this, I was really excited to see his art, but then like, <laughs> what the freak is that? And so their romance kicks off with her babysitting him through his medical 
routine. Some of the YouTube stuff is pretty well integrated into the movie. There's this small scene where Zach Cody is going through Stella's YouTube channel, and as he's scrolling, he's noticing that her younger sister appeared in a lot of her YouTube videos, and then in a lot of her newer ones, the sister just is completely gone, and that she died in some crazy accident. And they bring it around in a pretty interesting way, where like Stella has been carrying this baggage because she was supposed to be the one to die. Her parents had like mentally accepted the fact when she was a kid and diagnosed with cystic fibrosis that she was gonna die young, but they weren't mentally prepared for their other daughter to die. It was like, thought-provoking and honestly like pretty upsetting. The biggest blunder about this movie straight up is the fact that it completely like rips off one of the songs that's in The Fault in Our Stars. And I snuck in for 10 minutes and I sat with- Five feet apart. They're like, you know that song at the end of The Fault in Our Stars? It was pretty good. Maybe we should steal it. And to make it worse, the character is talking about stealing in that scene. You're not the thief anymore. I'm the thief now. I do gotta say though, out of all of these movies, this one feels the most fetishy. There's this scene where they're sitting by the pool together and they proceed to like strip in front of each other and then like show each other their medical scars. But like it's played off as like sexy that they're stripping in front of each other. Now that we're in the third act, I was like, it is about to go down, y'all. They were skating on the ice rink and I was like, the ice is gonna freaking break and they will die. He tells her that he loves her. And then at that exact moment, she gets a text from her parents saying that they finally found a lung transplant from her. She's been on this list for freaking forever and they thought that she wasn't gonna ever get a transplant and she finally did. And then she like ignores all of the messages from her nurses and her family. All of these teenagers keep falling in love and then deciding that they wanna die. In Midnight Sun, homegirl goes out in the boat and she's freaking dead and everything, everything, she runs out of the house and she's gonna die. And then in this movie, she has the chance to get lungs, but because she's in love, she doesn't want to get the lungs. All I'm picking up is that people want to die when they fall in love, so I guess it's good that I've been lonely my whole freaking life. And all this was like boring and stupid, but then it freaking happened! Homegirl is sitting on the bridge and out of nowhere. <laughs> Oh man, I love that so much. I don't know why. Maybe it's because it seems fake. But then, turns out she's completely fine. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, this movie is doing something clever where it's like gonna make you think that it's gonna be cliche and follow the same formula as all the other ones. Um, <laughs> but then. Please, it's cold. Stella? They show her and she's just like, which is weird because in a scene earlier, we saw her swimming. So I don't know if you know where this is going, but Zach Cody is like, oh, the only way to save her is to give her mouth to mouth. But there seems to be an issue. If their mouths touch, their bacteria will meet and they will die. This scene is so weird because he starts to give her mouth to mouth but for some reason they play like a romantic score in the background. I do love that though, that they're like hyping up a romantic moment, like they're finally kissing, but like she's actually unconscious and actually dead. She wakes up from her lung transplant and then Zach Cody gives the longest monologue I've ever heard in my entire life. I've never seen a character say so much but also say nothing. You know, people are always saying, if you love something, you have to learn to let it go. I thought that was such bullshit. I don't know what comes next. I don't regret any of this. I'm sorry. I need you to be safe from me. I watched you almost die. All I want is to be with you. I have watched this monologue like actually three or four times and I couldn't tell you a single thing that he says. I couldn't even give you like the thesis of what he says. Hey sis, I know that we've been pretty hot and heavy these days. Congratulations on the lungs, but my treatment isn't making me feel any better and I'm probably not gonna get a transplant anytime soon. So 
Basically, I'm gonna dump yo ass, and then he leaves and we never see him again, and it's kind of hinted at that he probably died. I gotta be honest, I feel like one of the only reasons why I randomly feel negative toward this movie is because I had watched so many movies with the exact same plot and the exact same characters, where every time there was something kind of similar, I was bitter about it. I give this movie like a six out of 10. It wasn't bad, but like, <laughs> what the hell? This video is in no way me saying that movies that feature illness as a main plot point are inherently bad. It's just interesting to see how many times a movie studio will remake the same movie until people stop buying into it. And I gotta be honest, I don't think we've reached the end of it. The last movie on this list came out at the beginning of 2019. And so like, for sure, we're probably gonna get another one this year or maybe next year, straight up, watch Watching all the movies for this video low-key took like years off of my life. Maybe I'll die soon then. And if that does happen, <laughs> it'll be pretty sexy. Hey, so Grace has cancer, and plot twist, so do I. I'm in love with Augustus, but soon one of us will die. But our boyfriend Isaac got dumped, we egged his girlfriend's house. I bet in like 25 years, they're gonna remake The Valnar Stars and it's gonna be like the same plot, but they're gonna be like, I have this jewel pod, but I don't put the pod in it, so I won't let it kill me. It's a simile. <laughs>